Good morning and welcome to everybody. Uh, we are going to be taking one of our deeper dives as part of our series on uh, the Milan Clinical Inventories and uh, the classification system that uh, is the backbone of the MCMI-4. Uh, this one having to do with some of the attention-seeking folks that we may be dealing with in our clinical practice and looking at some delineations between um, one which is part of the official nomenclature, the histrionic personality, as well as one that uh, is part of the overarching theory that supports the test. And that is a more recent addition, which I'll talk about in detail in a little while, the turbulent personality. Before we begin, uh, we're still in a little bit of housekeeping mode before we get into the content. Because we are offering CEs, and as uh, standard of practice, I am required to disclose that uh, I am one of the co-authors of the MCMI-4, and as part of that, I do have a minor financial interest in the instrument. So please bear that in mind as I describe some of the concepts that we're talking about. Although we're not really getting into the instrument itself, we are talking about concepts that are very closely related. There are no non-financial relationships to disclose. And also I want to just point out the Pearson Clinical Assessment Division to sponsor this webinar, develop and distribute assessments and intervention tools for psychologists and speech language pathologists. And this webinar covers information that pertains to the effective and appropriate use of one of the Pearson instruments, the MCMI-4. Okay, with that in mind, let's take a look at what we're going to be doing today. What you have in front of you right now is a sort of a quick overview from a high level of what we're going to be looking at, what we're going to be focusing on throughout the course of this webinar today. Part one at the top is going to be very brief. We've learned over time with the webinars that we presented that are similar to this one that we tend to spend quite a bit of time on uh, the theory itself, and that tends to take away from some of the clinical information that follows. So we have made an effort in this webinar to really kind of boil that down to some of the essentials. I would point to some of our other recorded webinars as well as Dr. Milan's most recent uh, theory book as well as uh, the essentials of MCMI-4 assessment if you want a better overview of the theory itself but I will be covering just the basics as they pertain to our information today. Part two is where we'll be spending most of our time. And in part two, we have our focus on these two patterns from uh, Milan's theory and how that relates then to the scales on the MCMI-4. And throughout this time, we should be looking at these particular objectives, describing the motivating aims, which is part of the theory, of the histrionic and the turbulent personality patterns, we want to compare the attention-seeking patterns. That's just one component, but it's one of particular interest for, uh, for a lot of clinicians, that this is usually a behavior that they want to focus on with people who match some of these patterns, the attention-seeking patterns that are evidenced by both of the prototypes that we'll be talking about. And from there, we'll want to explain some treatment direction based on the, the motivating aims of the individual. I like to add to this that one of the views that I like to be able to espouse and really try to articulate as best as possible is that, you know, very consistent with a lot of the conversation that's happening now and has happened for some time when it comes to personality diagnosis and personality categories versus dimensions, that this very much is a dimensional approach despite the use of categorical nomenclature. And that should become evident because as we go along, I'll be talking about not just the basic patterns that we're talking about here, but how they add mix together. First with some example from when you might see both histrionic and turbulent patterns in one individual and how the basic domains and uh, the dimensions tend to play out there. But then also when you see different admixtures of this pattern with some other patterns, and uh, I'll be going through a couple of examples, one of which is, uh, I would say it's not based on, but it is inspired by a recent client. And I'll point that out as we go, as we go along with that. Here's our basic time frame. And uh, so far we're 
somewhat on time. We have a few minutes left for the first component. Up until 12.15, we'll be talking about the motivating aims of both patterns. From there until about halfway through, um, we'll be looking at how the two patterns are alike and how the two patterns are different, with a particular focus on attention seeking, but not necessarily limited to just that. And through the last, let's say, uh, the third quarter of uh, what we're going to be looking at approximately, we're going to be taking a look at those motivating aims, those domains, and how they relate to a potential treatment course and try to start to illustrate some of the treatment directions there. And we will try to leave approximately 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So that's kind of our schedule for the overall part of today. And with that in mind, let's take a look at our first section. And that would be a very brief recap of Milan's evolutionary theory. We're going to capture this primarily in three slides very quickly. What I'd like you to try to help you orient to what we do here is the top, first the top part of this slide. That is the evolutionary polarities. Think of these as the motivating components of any personality, and they do map out the different categorical uh, personality prototypes that we see on the instrument, but I'd like you to think of them as something a bit more fluid than that, and that is that uh, without getting into a lot of what I often talk about in terms of the commonalities between this and evolution, just kind of speaking about these as motivations. Every human being matching with the natural world, according to Milan's theory, has connections to three polarities that represent motivation. The first being pleasure versus pain, which in essence is the idea of trying to sustain life on the pain side or the pain avoidance side, trying to not allow for things that might be destructive to the individual in this case from a psychological perspective, versus pleasure or what is more fulfilling to an individual. I uh, want to point out before we go to the next one that you should also think of these as continua and not necessarily one category versus the other. The second, active versus passive, which is how we tend to orient ourselves to our world and how we act upon the world, whether that be by an active orientation, which would be entering an environment and making changes to that environment, acting upon the environment, in other words, to make it suit our needs, versus a more passive approach. A passive approach being one where we find a suitable enough environment, and if there are changes to be made, we make those changes to the self rather than to the environment. And then the third, based on the idea that none of us will be here forever, we borrow from evolution the idea of self versus other which is a concept that I think that we're very familiar with in psychology, of where do we nurture? Do we tend to only try to nurture ourselves or do we only try to nurture other people or where do we fall on this continuum? Like I said, with this being a continuum, one of the qualities of a person who is adaptive would be that they have their set or favored ways of being along these different continuums. But the environment and the other people in the world and the demands of their life will pull for them to be flexible and adaptive along these continua. The more flexible and adaptive, while not losing self-definition some may be, the better they probably will be able to adhere to a society, a community, a culture, and be able to get along within that context. But the more inflexible, the more that they become stuck or conflicted along any one of these points, the more difficulty they may have. All of that being said, and this will all become relevant as I describe some of these patterns that we'll get into in a moment, then play out into what we can observe and what we can infer through eight different domains or eight different dimensions, if you will, of of personality that are related to four levels that you'd see along the first column. We have behavioral, phenomenologic, intrapsychic, and biophysical. All of these being sort of the major categories of schools of thought that we have in 
the world of psychology, different ways that we look at things, broken down into functional domains, which are those which are more so the ones that we can look at, directly measure, and be able to observe in some sort of a more tangible way, as well as structural domains, which are those that we may need to infer, we may need to gather via different kinds of questioning, and those that are structural primarily are in the more intrapsychic, more biophysical realm, functional being more behavioral and to some degree more phenomenologic, although there's some crossover as you can see. As we go along and as they're relevant, I'll be defining each of these eight that fall under the other two columns there as they relate to the patterns that we have. The next element that I'd like to take a quick look at is that we have the focus here, as we see in the orange boxes, of which personality patterns we're looking at as they relate to and as they're ordered along Milan's taxonomy, the personality spectra. Something to keep in mind here is that the, the model that sits underneath has become more dimensional. And you can see this in some ways by looking across the rows for each one. If you look at the first column, you'll see what we now have as some abbreviations for the common patterns that we know. And then three different levels of functioning. Normal style, which for the first one we commonly refer to as schizoid, which is actually the clinical disorder nomenclature. We have an apathetic style, an asocial abnormal type, and a schizoid clinical disorder. These three ranges do correlate to base rate scores on the MCMI-4. The areas are 60 to 74 for the first, 75 to 84 for the second, and 85 and above for the third. That won't be a focus of our attention today, but I just want to mention that for basic reference points. So the two that we have are approximately in the middle of the taxonomy. Those are the histrionic and the turbulent, which have um, associated normal styles and abnormal types. I'll be focusing more on clinical areas in this presentation, but I do want you to keep in mind that there are different variants and different levels of functioning within this model. Last point about the theory in general will be that we'll be looking at the domains that I referenced earlier. If you look across the top, the column headers of this table show the different domains that I mentioned before in the first slide, expressive emotion, interpersonal conduct, cognitive style, and so on. And down the side, we have the listing of the different spectra, the 15 personality spectra. The highlights that you see here are the facet scales. Those belong to the Grossman facet scales of the MCMI-4. But that is not the limit of what we can do in terms of being able to dimensionalize these different aspects. And again, you see where the two that we'll be focusing on are here about in the middle, along with those that are highlighted for as a facet scale and those that are just part of this uh, dimensional view of these different characteristics. So that is a very brief overview, and I know it's a lot of information to fit into sort of a theoretical context in a very short amount of time. Please be re you know, rest assured that uh, as we go through this, I'm going to be illuminating the relevant points of that as they become part of our focus. So let's take a look at our patterns that we have here. We're going to first distinguish the histrionic and turbulent personality patterns based on both those motivating aims I just referenced as well as the domains and how prominent any of the domains may be. Beginning with a, with a histrionic spectrum pattern, how these tend to work across our basic motivations, our motivating aims, and the example that we have here with histrionic, which is one from the official nomenclature of the DSM, that we would define in terms of this theory, not just by the criterion list that we have in the DSM, but by the basic motivations that make up what we call a prototypal pattern. You probably won't find a perfect prototype in your clinical practice. You won't find somebody who meets this criteria and matches all of the domains simply as is 
you're going to see admixtures. But we use a prototypal approach so that we have sort of a reference point for which to be able to compare um, the real life person, the, the patient or client that you are seeing in your practice. And what defines the histrionic pattern is a tendency primarily to, towards two of the motivating patterns. First being the active, and second being other orientation. So what does that mean? It's primarily defined by the idea that this is a person who is continually monitoring and adjusting and acting upon the environment in order to help define the self through their interactions with other people. There's other components as well. Uh, the uh, idea that they are very actively oriented in the prototypal pattern would define them as being somewhat lacking in terms of being able to shut off, to activate the, the parasympathetic nervous system, to just simply allow what's in the world to be. A little less so as far as the other because they are really trying to develop a sense of self and they do have a self-reflection although it's not something that they keep in very clear awareness throughout most of, uh, most of their interactions. But primarily we have a pattern here that is defined by that activity and the sense that what they do and who they are and most of what they're about depends on how it is that others reflect on them. When we, ch we change to a more molecular view of this and begin to look at uh, aspects and domains that might meet some of the criteria of the DSM, as well as my, what might overlap with the alternative model of the DSM, we start to look at the different domains, those different areas that we looked at. To read these, and I'll be showing you this kind of a slide as well throughout the program today, you want to note that the larger the circle, the more prominent, at least in terms of how the theory predicts a prototype, how prominent that particular quality might be. What we see primarily with the histrionic spectrum is attention-seeking interpersonal conduct, a fickle mood or temperament relating to their biophysical entity. And what we found in sampling uh, the, the MCMI4 tends to see more of a, a uh, gregarious self-image, although that seems to be in, in the theoretical prediction something that's a bit smaller. Rounding out the picture tends to be qualities that mean that it's very difficult for a person to be able to maintain focus on one and only one thing. So we see something of a flighty cognitive style. We tend to see a bit of dissociation when it comes to the way that they relate on a deeper level with people. They, you know, once, once a relationship has been used for the purpose that it really needs to be used, it becomes less exciting and becomes less of a focus. And there may even be times where it becomes, after a while, something that uh, something that that uh, becomes less it's so less of a focus that it almost becomes a dissociated kind of a relationship. We will see typically dramatic emotion. We'll see gregarious self-image, and this is sort of what makes up the overall constellation. Once again, though, I want to point out that this is the this is the prototype for the histrionic. And generally speaking, you won't see an exact match to this. You're going to see other admixtures. You're going to see emphases in different places. And more than likely, those of you who are familiar with uh, the MCMI and use that or the MMPI or really any of the instruments regularly, you'll see admixtures with other personality prototypes and patterns. The next that we'll look at is one that is probably not as familiar to most, and that is the turbulent pattern. In some ways, it looks very much the same, at least on a superficial level to the histrionic, but there's very different motivations. They share an active orientation. They share this active orientation with the world. Okay. And my highlight was not working there. Rather than focusing so much on the interpersonal aspects, they do have a very strong push towards interpersonal, but not at their core motivation. 
the emphasis is one, and it's the only one throughout the entire spectra of personalities where the emphasis is on pleasure or fulfillment or goal orientation. What you tend to see here is a pattern that is oftentimes rather healthy and remains healthy and remains very spirited and remains very much attuned to the world and goal-oriented and goal-directed until there becomes a problem, which is that it's to a level that most people are not. And there tends to be some kind of a dissociation that happens and there's a rather sharp turn towards a more clinical presentation at the higher end of the turbulence spectrum. And that is that at some point they tend to wear people out. They brought people along to do their bidding. They brought people along to be involved in what it is that they're interested in. They develop a lot of attention, as it were, to their world by virtue of being able to keep interest in some kind of a goal or keep interest in some kind of a phenomenon in the world. And eventually people say enough of that, and they're left in something of an echo chamber. This is a, sort of a typical presentation. This happens you know, not just with one person, or not just at one time, but at different times. We tend to see that a person becomes less attuned and less able to be able to monitor their own affect and less able to manage what they see is uh, they're being goal-directed and they're being in a legitimate and validated sort of view of themselves in the world. We then start to see this play out if we look over at the different domains and dimensions as something of a scattered cognitive style. They really do try to capture all things for all people that also includes the mercurial mood or temperament to be able to match that mood to whatever might be coming along. They tend to be very high-spirited, impetuous, and one of the pieces that I'll be talking about that really relates to the problem of attention-seeking is magnification, which is not one of the facet scales, but it's one that I think really becomes very important when we look at their interpersonal consciousness. Most people, when they get the social cues that people have reached a limit with whatever it is that they might be talking about, that, pe that they are being, being given appropriate negative sorts of stimuli that say, okay, enough with what you're talking about, enough with the subject, uh, we need to be able to move on, um, you're tiring me out, any of these kind of phenomena, most people will begin to back down. Uh, we're talking about people that are able to read social cues. And I wouldn't say that the that people with a turbulent pattern cannot read social cues, but they have a different reaction. That is a magnification. That is that what they tend to do is they tend to double down. If they're not getting their attention, they push harder. And if they don't get their attention from pushing harder, they may push harder still, and so on and so forth. It starts to really really push on uh, the limits of other people or the situations that they might be in. They find themselves in situations where they're no longer supported and at times possibly um, dissociated and misattuned to the rest of their environment. This is where the vulnerability to some of the more syndromal kinds of difficulties might come from, such as depression, such as anxiety, and so on and so forth. So if we were to look at these two patterns, I want to kind of highlight the domains that we have here and some of the differences that we see, particularly in the areas that we want to look at here. We have, on the histrionic side, a dramatic expression, very much about look at me, look at how, how, much, uh, how much I can be entertaining, how much I can be engaging and gregarious versus an impetuous expression, in that one being more along the lines of I'm going to continue to do. It's not necessarily the emphasis on me, but it does bring about a strong attention-seeking kind of a quality. It's a matter of where that attention really is. Then, okay, the next one down is about the interpersonal realm, attention-seeking versus high-spirited. 
And one you can see is uh, inferring an emotion that's much more about being energetic and being very much engaged. The other one is about, look again, look at me. Won't go through all of these, but you, uh, I want to point out a couple of uh, the areas that are relevant to what we're talking about. The uh, history on it being more gregarious. That is, let's include everybody, let's bring everybody in. But turbulent being more exalted, and that is that I have something that I want to show you, and it's something very special and something that is rather unique to me. This also crosses over to some degree into narcissistic characteristics. Uh, we haven't used narcissistic as one of the co, um, co-occurrences in this presentation, but I do want to just mention that, that there is sometimes a, an important distinction, a differential diagnosis, or to look at you know, what elements might be from the narcissistic pattern versus the turbulent pattern. So we have some similarities here and some differences, and let's take a closer look at how it is that they look together. First of all, let's take a look at the common ground. For the histrionic and turbulent, attention-seeking sorts of characteristics, just considering for right now the prototypal kind of a presentation, what do they have in common? Um, I'd like to divide these out in this presentation into tactics as well as characteristics. So what they do as well as what we might be able to describe. Under tactics for both of them, I would say that they both to some degree are environmentally based. That is that they're not so much based on bringing attention to who they are. Now that changes when you talk about a histrionic personality because they are bringing attention to themselves, but it's not about who they are. It's about what they can do in, this, in, in the more communal space. With turbulent, it's not so much about bringing attention to themselves as bringing attention to the focus of whatever it is that they might be showing you, doing for themselves, seeking out as a goal. They do both tend to use fairly dramatic terms, fairly, dr fairly dramatic language, and both rely to a pretty good degree, except in different places, on exaggeration. How that plays out tends to show a difference between the attention-seeking qualities between the two. Common characteristics, a primary motivation. I know this is a motivation for pretty much everybody on the planet, but this is a, a very important one. I would say it's a double down sort of a motivation for both of these is validation. Seeking to be able to justify the self in any given moment. And I think that part's very important. They both seek out their reinforcement in that way, not necessarily through a deeper relationship with one individual or through one particular pursuit, but by numbers, by being able to say that this is some, yeah, what, what they're pursuing or what they're drawing their attention to is something that everybody can appreciate. This, we infer from the theory, is fueled by a deficit that they tend to have in terms of identity, in terms of their inner structure, in terms of feeling like a whole person for who they are on their own rather than what they do or what they're, uh, what they're pursuing or what they're showing you or, or what is engaged in activity at any given particular time. And finally, I think one of the, one of the key characteristics here is that uh, you know, this is something that we actually try to encourage in some people. And as a general overall goal, we like to be able to help people be aware of the here and now with this particular, with these particular patterns, we may find that the here and now is overemphasized, and there may need to be some focus within what we do towards being aware of a larger picture or being aware of some kind of a consequence or something that may happen in the future. Much less so, you know, much more so than we would with other people where they're too worried about the future. They're too worried about what's coming down the road, and we need to bring them back into sort of the here and now. 
this would be the different emphasis here. Let's just focus down now on histrionic, attention-seeking sorts of characteristics. So this is just, at this point, limited to, although there might be some overlap with, but for the most part, this is, this is what's more unique to the histrionic, and that is that there's a tendency on attention-seeking patterns with charisma, gregariousness, a kind of theatric sort of a presentation. You might see a very dramatic presentation from a turbulent personality, but it's, again, usually focused on something outside rather than the focus on me. And there's a kind of a seductiveness, not necessarily in a sexual or intimate sort of a way, but a seductiveness in terms of bringing you into their world. And it's more based on personality, more based on the interpersonal than it is on any point of interest that they might be talking about. So that these characteristics include that unique uh, motivator, what I call unique primary motivation, interpersonal excitation. That is getting a person as excited about just being with this person more so than anything else. I would say that uh, histrionic patterns tend to play the game of life, and I'll make a comparison to turbulence in a moment that way. The deficit, and that is the fuel for their attention seeking, tends to be one of intimacy. And that seems a little bit a little bit uh, unexpected in certain ways, and that is because you, know, you, you might find that they are constantly seeking intimacy, but if you really think about the true definition of, in, of intimacy being one where you're very much able to be vulnerable with another person and they feel as though the person accepts you just for being you, that really is a, a deficit in this area. And the final one, I think, is really something that becomes very important terms of interpersonal treatment. And that is that with histrionics, and this differs in the next slide with the other, there is rarely a circumstance where once a relationship has had its course, that they continue to sustain that relationship in the same sort of way. There's, of course, exceptions made for family or people that they know are part of their permanent context. But in terms of how they interact with people, it's very much about the here and now, particularly with the relationships. And that continues to repeat itself, one after the other after the other. The more, the better, at least on a superficial level. But what we tend to see here is that they use the relationships for what they are valued for within that moment, after which time that tends to dissipate. Turning to the turbulent, looking at some of the same areas here, we notice that under common attention-seeking sorts of actions, we see passion for a cause. A lot of energy, a lot of activity, a lot of doing, a lot of acting upon the world, not necessarily acting to, grip, to grab attention for the self. It's almost more of a byproduct in certain ways, but at the same time, it's also fuel, and I think that's important to remember as well. There's also a seductiveness to this particular pattern. That is, you're going to be drawn in by people like this. These, um, some people that match with this pattern tend to be people who are gurus of some sort, or they are, and I've seen many colleagues in the wellness field who tend to espouse some of this, not necessarily by an overactivity, but with such a strong passion and such a strong focus on particular things that you can't really pull away. They will pull you in based more on interest, based more on what it is that they're looking at as opposed to the interpersonal. So some common characteristics there. The unique primary motivator here is goal attainment. Difference again from uh, the histrionic. Instead of playing the game of life, they seek to win the game of life. And that is how much can they accomplish? How much can they be able to show as far as what that, you know, what, what they're about? And therefore, that speaks to their deficits. The fuel for that manipulation tends to be entirely under-acknowledged. 
That is that uh, their deficit, uh, their feeling that they're not really whole without their attainment tends to be very under acknowledged. And they don't want to be able to look at that, so that then cycles down to this particular pattern, and that is the double down, as I called it. As I said before, most people, once they realize that they've lost the interest or they've lost the attention of somebody or they've read, they've read a social cue that uh, shows them a natural boundary, will start to back away from that. Whereas this one, because they really tend to be rather desperate to be able to maintain themselves, they'll double down. They'll hold on to relationships, even though the relationship seems to be one that has run its course. They will continue to try to keep those relationships alive, afloat, despite them not being necessarily the uh, most effective way of interpersonally relating. So just to summarize a little bit here, if we look one to the other, relation, uh, histrionic, relationally driven for excitement, turbulent, relationally driven to meet goals. So the histrionic is more about the game of life as opposed to winning the game of life. Uh, histrionics tend to be aware of, and I didn't mention this before, but sometimes may even operationally flaunt some of their deficits in order to gain attention. Or the turbulent tends to be that they don't want to be aware of, and they tend to suppress or possibly repress their deficits that they find within themselves and keep them completely out of awareness. And finally, in terms of sustained relationships, with histrionic, it's more so what is it about the next relationship? We're turbulent. Let's try to keep this as important as possible because a losing of that relationship would be a losing at that goal. If we look at them together, we can see that there really is some overlap between the two. And at this point, I want to start to look at some examples of what happens when you begin to combine these two patterns. First with each other, and then we'll use some examples of when these patterns are commingled with others in the Lance taxonomy and in the DSM. If we were to see someone who presents and maybe co-elevates on an MCMI, both 4A and 4B, I would tend to say that uh, if we're looking at the motivating aims, we're probably going to see that there's quite an extreme going on, more than likely, as far as a person tending to be very active, very much oriented towards changing the environment and making what's out there theirs for certain, rather than trying to accommodate to what might be out there in the environment. That has some very obvious sorts of uh, deficits in terms of how it is that they might be able to relate to circumstances as well as their world. For this pattern, you would probably see that there's probably much more of an emphasis on the other person, and it's much more about fulfillment. So you start to see both of those characteristics be combined in some ways, such that um, it, may be, it, it may become more like, I would say you know, there's some confusion between this and potentially some narcissistic characteristics because it really does become continued fulfillment. And one of the main differences is that the emphasis really continues to be on the other, whereas with a narcissistic pattern, it would be more like an emphasis on the self and what do I get for me rather than what do we get together. But the validation comes from what can we do, what do we get, how do you and I really share this thing, share what's going on in our world right now. So if we were to look at some possibilities of combinations, what I've done here is I've used a color scheme, and I'll explain this very briefly here, for uh, those domains that are derived from histrionic, those are in red. The ones in blue are from the turbulent pattern. And where we see a co-elevation, we'll use a purple, which is a combination of the colors. The ones that are shaded are also ones that on the MCMI are facet scales. You can notice with looking at these that even if it's a facet scale, it may not be emphasized. So, for example, fickle mood temperament in this, in this example, although it's a facet scale, although it's one that tends to show up here, it's not very prominent in this presentation. 
So here's just one example, and I'll show you another, of when we combine 4A and 4B. This one being very much about the attention seeking. You can see that that's really kind of the most prominent out of all of the domains. That combined with high spiritedness. So that the attention seeking is not going to be one where you see sort of a dramatic malaise or one where you see a very um, emotionally driven kind of attention seeking. It's going to be about continuous activity with impetuous emotion, that is, uh, impetuous behaviors. I've drawn the, uh, some of the histrionic components rather large. The shallow content, meaning that it's really so much more about what's happening in the moment than it is about the real connection between the two people, although within the moment that connection might be very important. And to some degree, a dissociation in a way, so that you really do see kind of a prominent turbulent pattern here with some aspects of letting go of any kind of a uh, longer-term idea or a deeper connection with another person. A different example here, we're looking at one that tends to be a bit more driven by In this one, um, the magnification I was talking about, the constantly pushing for continuing to keep a person's attention even beyond what uh, might be useful for the individual. So the magnification dynamic of the turbulent combined with dramatic expression, attention seeking in their personal conduct, and um, something of a scattered cognitive style. I noticed that I've colored one of these wrong. The exalted self-image should be one that's in, uh, that's in blue, and that tends to be relatively prominent as well. And start to see how these tend to look somewhat different depending on where the emphasis is. And any one of these different domains may be more or less prominent depending on the individual that you might be working with. We're going to move on a little bit now to uh, what happens when we see combinations that we might find with other personalities. So these, what I want to try to point out is uh, looking at when either the histrionic or the turbulent is combined with this one other pattern. And for this, I've chosen to use the compulsive uh, pattern. To describe the compulsive a little bit, just so we have some background here, because we'll be using this consistently throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, compulsive is one where the emphasis is on a passivity and an other orientation where a person is very rule-bound and duty-bound and tends to really adhere themselves very closely to what it is that society expects. It's not really about the other as much as it is about the world and the environment around what do I need to do? How do I need to? How do I need to be? What actions do I need to take within my world to be a good and valid and moral, et cetera, et cetera, type of person? The big yellow arrows pointing at each other represent, though, the big conflict that really kind of creates the problem with the compulsive, and that is that they completely deny their own self needs and their own self beliefs that might be any bit contrary to what's expected of them. Therefore, you tend to have this rather powerful kind of a conflict between the sense of self and the sense of other that creates a lot of unrest and usually happens under the surface. So what would happen here? I would say that we may have more of an active conflict between active and passive as well. So you're going to see conflict not just in terms of getting their own needs met, but whether or not they should take their own actions and act on their own best interests versus what's expected of them. And I think about how that would conflict with more of the superficial qualities of a histrionic personality, where you have someone who really needs to have that kind of validation from others and needs to have a lot of people notice what they're doing and at the same time is trying to deny that need for kind of the popular way of being. So that's another possibility and another combination. When we look at that in terms of 
the combination of elements, we'll start to see in this example, although this is just one example of what may come of this, um, the attention-seeking sorts of behavior, but also a very strong discipline, almost like those two may coalesce in some ways. And uh, difficulty with emotion, I would say, that's probably derived a lot from those conflicts, from the idea that they're never really getting their needs met. They both need to be organized and facile with what they do and attentive and disciplined to what they need, as well as well-liked, as well as well-regarded. So you can see where some of those conflicts may come in. A different combination, and I alluded to this at the beginning of the program, this one was to some degree inspired by results that I got from a client recently on an MCMI. Um, interesting note on this one that uh, they were compelled to come see me for some, some professionally related uh, behavior. And uh, they w were given as part of an overall psych evaluation outside of my own um, a full neuropsych and, and uh, cognitive psych exam as well as one personality instrument, not an MMPI or an FCMI, one of the other instruments that's uh, commonly used. And the emphasis was definitely not there, but the pieces that got put together described this person more as narcissistic than what I found once I was given, I gave them um, an MCMI, as well as an MPI 2RF and a Rorschach, and it was pretty consistent that these patterns tend to come out. If you have a 4B, the turbulent pattern, that active pleasure orientation, very goal-directed, very goal-oriented, combined with the compulsive characteristics where we assure our own personal needs and we do whatever it is that we need to do for the world. What we tended to see with some with a pattern like this, and I'll describe a little bit of this, this is the person who did a lot of professional consulting and was in different environments at different times and was not always completely familiar with the, uh, the rules and regulations, the policies and procedures of every organization and ended up doing some things that were, I would say, on a moral basis, you could make a very good argument for what this person did, but it was clearly against the ethics of the particular establishment that uh, this person was working in. So that was what ended up prompting, uh, prompting their, uh, their referral for an evaluation and ultimately for treatment. What did we end up having here? We ended up having a person who was very clear about what their objectives were and very passionate about what they wanted to do and what they wanted to accomplish and almost would stop at nothing to do that and adopting what they felt, you know, was their own moral or ethic about the general field that they were in and acting upon that rather than acting upon and, and missing the point of the differences between different entities where one might have have certain rules and another might have even moderately different rules. And that ends up becoming the difficulty for this particular individual. We tended to see magnification. You see at the bottom right over here that uh, they continued to double down in their efforts. They were fairly insistent that what they were about was really the correct way of doing things. They were very disciplined about how it was that they did that. This person did amazing amounts of work in a very short amount of time. One of the vulnerabilities, though, was the constriction from the compulsive side. So you imagine a constricted cognitive style, thinking of it in one very clear way, combined with the magnification that you would see in more of the turbulent pattern, you can see where this could get into quite a bit of trouble. I'm noticing that, again, you know, despite our efforts to try to really tighten up the, the front end and talking about theory, once again, we've kind of come up against our time to a degree. So I'm not going to go into the details that we usually go into as far as the, uh, the treatment objectives, but I'm going to move on towards the end and open this up now for questions that we might have. So for that, I'm going to turn that over again to Dr. McCrew, and uh, we can field 
the questions that we might have in the remaining time that, we, that we're looking at today. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Grossman. And there are a few questions. One is about um, forensic evaluations. Are elevations on the social desirability scale reflective of both of these patterns, histrionic and turbulent, when you also get elevations on those scales? Yeah, they are. Uh, we, we do have some incidental evidence right now that uh, there is some co elevation, particularly with the turbulent pattern, and a part of that is because of how that construct is put together. And that is that, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program today, that this is a pattern that really tends to be relatively pro-social, tends to be to go after a lot of very socially desirable kinds of conquests and kinds of kinds of goals, and that's very difficult to differentiate. The items as we've been looking at this problem really are worded in a uh, in a way that you know people who are not necessarily trying to be socially desirable would probably differentiate between that and what their what their real patterns are. But if there is a tendency to be socially desirable, you're going to see something of a Y, a y scale emphasis as well as a 4B. It doesn't tend to be as much of a co-elevation on histrionic scale. And I'll also mention that on the MCMI-3, this tended to be a difficulty with a compulsive scale. It's no longer a difficulty there either. So it's something that we're aware of and when you're talking about forensic evaluations, you really do need to make some differentiation there and take a look at the context and why it is they might be responding to some of the items on the turbulent scale the way that they are, that are different from items that are on the Y scale. Okay, thank you. And the language of um, fickle, when you think about temperament as fickle and mercurial, how would you differentiate between the two? Uh, the way that I would think about that one would be fickle to me sort of represents the idea that you really kind of move from one to the other to the other without any really true through line. So one mood is completely divorced in a way from the next one. So that you might see that uh, this particular mood that you're in because of the interaction that you have in the immediate is just about that moment. And then something else happens or the, or the attention is brought to another individual or another circumstance, and the mood is that one. Whereas with the other, I think there may be more of a through line between moods, but it's that mercurial would be more along the lines of giving your mood and affect its all in terms of whatever's happening in that moment but not necessarily completely unaffected from one to the next. And off the top of my head, that's probably the best I can really differentiate the two ideas. Okay, thank you. And then another question. Um, I went through Milan's 2011 text, but still have difficulties articulating the difference between the turbulent personality at the clinical level and a manic episode. Is the difference... Um, similar to m melancholic personality versus depression? It's, I think it's a pretty good parallel. I think looking at those two in that way, it's very much a, a parallel. Um, the depression example has one other stopping point, which becomes even more muddy in certain ways, and that is we now have uh, major depression and persistent depressive disorder. And... Uh, the difference between that and a melancholic personality really has much more to do with an overall pattern, including all of those different domains, and being able to draw from that as something that is more lifelong and characteristic rather than something that is occurring in the immediate, whether that's more sustained or whether that's more just in that particular moment. Um, I think it's clearer with a manic episode versus a turbulent personality in that uh, a manic episode, you oftentimes really take leave of any kind of a good grasp of reality. Whereas with a turbulent personality who's more extreme, you would probably see more of a connection to reality, but more of a willfully ignoring certain 
aspects of it and not to the same extreme as a manic episode. Okay, thank you. And then finally, does borderline personality disorder overlap more than other personality disorders? Um, it's fairly well established, I think, with, uh, with histrionic. That, that is the case. A histrionic as well as negativistic or passive-aggressive personality, which is no longer part of the official nomenclature. But histrionic certainly is one where it's been demonstrated that there's quite a bit of overlap. There's not enough evidence at this point to make that same declaration with turbulent, but in terms of the theory, I could see that being a phenomenon that, uh, that would match. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today.